Dr. Narita, would you mind introducing our uh, our lecturer? Hey, uh, uh, first of all, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Dasgupta. He is a senior physician and medical director of uh, TV control program, Los Angeles County. His uh, specialty background is in pediatric infectious diseases. And you know he also still holds uh, you know appointment with the Harbor you know UCLA uh, Medical Center, and he got you know a couple of teaching awards from UCLA. And you know I I am so grateful that you know uh, Sean prepared you know this uh, uh, liver spending regimen talk. Uh, I appreciate you know he spent a lot of time and energy on this. So without further ado, I just want to ask uh, Sean to. Talk about that. Go ahead. Thank you for um, thank you for inviting us to participate in this session and speak to your audience. Um, I'm going to. I have a lot of material that I want to try to get through. This is a really, um, I think, important practical issue that busy clinicians deal with um, all the time. Um, let me make sure that. You can hear my audio okay, and you can see my slides before I begin. Everything good? Okay, okay. good, Tom. Thank you. Great. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, here are some learning objectives for you. Some common abbreviations that I'll, that I'll be using in the slides. Um, INH, RIF, EMB, uh, PZA, sometimes referred to as HREZ. Um, some other abbreviations for second line drugs. So I think when we're when we're talking about um, potential drug induced liver injury due to first line TB agents, the um, going back to basic principles is really important, and thinking about how we're going to try to approximate some of the effects of the first line drugs um, and uh, how the second line agents that we may or may not use uh, respond to those same prerogatives. So for, you know, with rifampin, we're using it primarily as a sterilizing agent, although it does exhibit some early bactericidal activity, uh, particularly um, after several days of therapy, isoniazid is the most potent of the first line drugs in terms of EBA. Pyrazinamide primarily provides sterilizing activity, um, killing off the semi-dormant bacilli and allowing treatment shortening down below nine months to six months. Ethambutol is primarily there as a, a protector of companion drugs, primarily to protect uh, rifampin in case of isoniazid resistance, for example. Also, as we're thinking about how to monitor patients who are on first-line anti-TB treatment, just wanna say um, up front that any combination of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, I would add to this list even uh, fever or rash should probably prompt some clinical assessment as well as probably some labs as well. In, in terms of the first-line drugs that we're particularly worried about causing um, drug-induced liver injury, we think about isoniazid, rifampin, and PZA. And um, in general, the definitions of biochemical um, uh, transaminitis are ALT greater than or equal to three times upper limit uh, normal with uh, signs or symptoms of, of drug-induced hepatitis or five times upper limit of normal, regardless of whether the patient has signs or symptoms. To this, I think I'd also add, um, it warrants uh, some attention to Alcafos and t Billy in particular. Some risk factors for drug-induced liver injury, um, many of which are familiar to you all as busy TB clinicians, but um, uh, you know, historically we thought about age 35 and older, um, in Seattle King County, I think uh, data has established 75 years of age and perhaps even 65 years of age as risk factors. Um, race ethnicity is an important consideration in some uh, in some local health jurisdictions. Um, pregnancy, HIV, chronic viral hepatitis, um, particularly 
hep B and hep C. Um, other underlying liver disease, which we know, you know, with the um, increase in metabolic disease in the general population, the worry about NAPL, um, even biliary pathology and um, idiopathic cirrhosis or fibrosis. Substance use disorder, particularly in the pandemic era, I think, um, and actually pre-pandemic era, um, has seen uh, um, and substantial increases in the general population, sometimes undetected, sometimes undiagnosed. Um, also think about other medications, acetaminophen and statins are common offenders that I think of. Um, and just in general, the same things that can cause, that can be part of TB disease, like malnutrition, hypoalbuminemia, can be risk factors for liver injury attributable to first line drugs. So the rest of this talk is gonna be built around two cases or scenarios. The first patient, um, this was actually, I, I believe the first um, hospital consultation that um, I provided for TB control program here in LA County um, several years ago. It was a 14-year-old uh, US born HIV negative female, um, history of trisomy 21 or Down syndrome had some cardiac disease, hypothyroidism, and recently had been diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Is now admitted with fever and diarrhea times two days. I, I honestly think that the fever was probably going on a little bit longer and the diarrhea um, was something that had been present at the beginning of the diagnosis of Crohn's disease, improved and then came back. The patient, because of the Crohn's disease diagnosis, had um, received systemic corticosteroids as well as a couple of doses of infliximab um, monthly. A TST had been placed at the time of initiation of infliximab and steroids um, and was reportedly negative, although finding documentation in the chart of the actual in duration uh, measurement was difficult in retrospect. The um, patient had no for, no travel outside of South LA, but um, parents were known to be Mexican born. Patient was noted to be tachycardic, febrile, um, a little bit hypotensive, um, but otherwise, uh, and, and a little bit lethargic, um, but arousable. No other focal findings. These were initial labs. You can see there was a little bit of AKI, perhaps some thrombocytopenia, anemia, um, and uh, baseline LFTs looked okay. This was the chest X-ray. As a TB audience, um, you all are thinking the same thing that we were thinking, is that this looks like it could be miliary tuberculosis. The patient also had some additional imaging that showed ascites. Um, There's also some quote-unquote fatty infiltra infiltration of the liver. Um, there was an echogenic mass um, and as well as some mild gallbladder wall thickening. Uh, a CT of the abdomen failed to re-demonstrate -demonstra re the focal lesion in the liver for what it's worth, but there was definitely some uh, quite a bit of ascites and um, uh, ileitis as well as colitis. Now, because of the... Um, the two cell lines being down in a patient with Down syndrome, um, there was concern about the possibility that this uh, new febrile illness um, represented uh, leukemic conversion. And so a bone marrow biopsy was done, which did not show leukemia, but showed marked granulomatous inflammation. There was also presence of hemophagocytosis, Because of the presence of granulomas, AFB staining was done, and the addendum showed it was read as um, numerous AFB. That prompted the concern for disseminated uh, mycobacteriosis, of course. Um, stool was the first result that came back, it was two plus AFB stain positive. At that point, rifabutin, nifambutal, and azithromycin had been started for presumed disseminated MAC. This is a center that has um, a decent amount of experience with HIV. So 
Um, this may reflect the, the bias of the, those particular providers. Additional evaluation then slowly came back showing that the patient had um, uh, disseminated uh, miliary pulmonary tuberculosis. Um, and these were the initial rapid molecular tests. The um, expert MTB RIF was done in house. Um, the stool PCR that you see with no catchy mutation detected um, was a send up through Mayo. Patient continues to have diarrhea as well as fever, and there's some concern about drug malabsorption at this point. Um, the, so this is this is how I think about um, starting parenteral regimens for TB. Is um, you're kind of you know if you have avail if you have IV rifampin available um, and add a respiratory fluoroquinolone, specifically levo or moxifloxacin, that kind of um, is a core uh, parenteral regimen that you can then build on depending on the comorbidities, toxicities that you're worried about, um, and ability to monitor a patient. So I generally look at rifampin, um, levofloxacin, um, and then adding, a lina adding either linazolid or an injectable agent like anacasin. Um, in the literature, uh, people will also talk about um, parenteral isoniazid. I personally have never been able to access it um, at any of the facilities that I provide care at or provide consultation for. Um, um, so, you know, it's a, a big caveat, big uh, um, uh, asterisk there. For a patient, rifabutinib thambutol was switched to, we continued isoniazid PO, thambutol PO for whatever activity we could get out of them, but then also added additional drugs to ensure a fully parenteral regimen. In this case, I think the um, amicacin was chosen over linazolid, um, primarily because of the severe cytopenias. Although in retrospect, I think the cytopenias were probably a result of uh, uh, AFB invasion, not, not uh, an intrinsic problem. So um, one could argue that maybe linazolid would have been an acceptable choice here. The patient developed a rash on uh, this regimen a few days in, and uh, repeat labs also showed um, worsening severe thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, anemia, um, some increase in uh, actually uh, relative stability in AST, ALT, increase in ALKFOS, and um, a market increase in the total bilirubin. And this was mostly conjugated hyperbilly. Um, despite initiation of amicacin, the patient's creatinine did improve with supportive care and initiation of their anti TB treatment. So, how do we? You know what what resources exist out there for us to um, uh, address possible or proven hepatotoxicity for patients who need to be on um, anti TB treatment for TB disease. This is the 2006 American Thoracic Society statement um, figure on uh, monitoring and management of hepatotoxicity during monitoring for and management of hepatotoxicity during. Uh, treatment for TB disease. A couple of things that I'll point out in this algorithm is the, um, you know, the uh, use of five times upper limit of normal ALT or three times upper limit of normal, depending on the clinical presentation, as well as a general preference for inclusion of rifamycins or rifampin in um, uh, empiric in, in anti-TB treatment. Another resource um, that is worth looking at, I think, is a, an, a couple of algorithms on up-to-date. Um, this is under the article for um, TB drugs, so not under treatment, not, not under treatment for susceptible disease, but in the general overview on TB drugs. Um, parts of this have been um, uh, modified or revised in response to feedback provided by our program. Um, the one thing that I did want to point out here also was the um, inclusion of the idea of having bridging regimens with liver sparing drugs, um, which I'll get into in more detail. 
for this patient, so we've got a severe hyperbilly that um, actually uh, continued to rise. The, the hyperbilirubinemia continued even after holding rifampin. Um, this is a patient with uh, really severe disease, smear positive, uh, apparently disseminated, and clinically quite ill. Um, uh, kind of hectic fevers, no matter what we were doing with the TB meds, it turns out. So in this situation, I think um, most people would agree that holding all anti-TB treatment is not a good option. So what do you do in that situation when you're dealing with possible drug-induced liver injury? This is from a review paper um, by authors in India. Um, that I think provides some practical guidance based on an expert consensus or experience um, that is helpful to look at. Um, um, unfortunately, the data in this zone are quite thin, despite the frequency with which we encounter these situations, both in inpatients and in ambulatory patients. Um, in this algorithm, they do acknowledge the importance of potentially continuing um, anti-TB treatment with a target of at least three non-hepatotoxic drugs, even when um, acute uh, um, hepatotoxicity is occurring, and <clears throat> reinforce the idea in the um, ATS guidelines about reevaluating every three to seven days um, to make sure that uh, uh, therapy is optimized as soon as possible, even with even when when you had to hold initially. Here are some um, kind of rules that I use when I'm providing consultation. Is um, the first thing, of course, is to make sure that we're evaluating for um, other potential contributors and uh, assess the the risk for really fulminant hepatotoxicity if we don't make a change. Um, so making sure if we haven't already done so that we know the HIV status, that we know whether the patient has chronic viral hepatitis that could be potentially treated or at least accounted for, um, review the active med list and substitute or discontinue any of those agents um, according to clinical status. Um, for outpatients in particular, um, depending on the population, ask about uh, any supplements that they may be taking that haven't been disclosed previously, any even herbal teas, that kind of thing. And then also thinking about liver uh, disease staging, which can include some labs. Um, here, I should also include uh, considering an ultrasound or some other imaging of the liver, making sure that we know whether there's a nodular surface or um, uh, enlarged versus shrunken liver for age and sex. Um, here are some general potential indications for modifying or holding therapy. The reason that I put these in is because it's what, you know, the question is always, what is three times upper limit of normal? What is five times upper limit of normal? And the ATS guidelines essentially say it depends on the assay being used at the particular lab. From a surveillance perspective, for me, um, uh, reviewing, you know, dozens of cases every day, um, it's difficult for me to be able to know what the upper limit of normal is. but I think most people, in most, most labs, most people, you would expect that um, an ALT above 50 is probably abnormal. So um, uh, based on that, I uh, use three times 50 being 150, five times 50 being 250. Um, I also make sure to include the T-Billy. Um, uh, I think some, some may want to use a lower threshold, like two. But certainly once the t billy rises above three, and especially if it's conjugated, I need to um, uh, stop and think. Some thresholds for rechallenging. Um, these are a little bit unclear and somewhat uh, based on expert consensus, um, but these are the thresholds that I use, AST, ALT less than 100, and t billy less than two. In general, um, in the United States, we prioritize erythromycin-based regimens for susceptible TB. So even if you can't get back onto the other first-line agents that are potentially hepatotoxic, really, really focus on trying to get that erythromycin back on board because that is what shortens total treatment duration for the patient. 
Um, expanding on a couple of the other uh, the other issues here, um, I generally try to rechallenge or at least get labs to try to rechallenge every three to seven days in the inpatient setting. Um, you have a little bit more uh, ability to monitor very closely, of course, and the uh, ambulatory setting, it may be a little bit longer, every five to seven days, perhaps. Um, but certainly, once you're uh, off therapy or on a, a potentially suboptimal holding regimen, um, you've got to keep moving every week. You've got to keep moving and try to get back onto a fully active, potent regimen, preferably with erythromycin. Um, uh, to that point, generally prioritizing erythromycin, I personally, my practice has been to afford patients at least two opportunities to tolerate rifampin before switching to rifabutin. And this is um, based on actually the case that I'm, I'm discussing here. This is uh, actually the a version of um, a cheat sheet that I came up with to try to, and I use this um, uh, at least once a week, if not more often, um, myself to try to think through really complicated cases like this to figure out what my options are and how I'm going to build an empiric anti-TB treatment regimen that is individualized to the patient um, based on their sites of disease, based on their comorbidities, toxicities, presumed susceptibility or resistance, um, accounting for all of those things. Um, and again, these are these are uh, this is my personal approach. Um, so, uh, um, open to feedback, input, critique, or uh, adoption, adaptation to your own setting. Um, I generally try to get at least three likely effective agents in the regimen, with at least two of them being potent or vector, quote unquote, bactericidal. Um, those are uh, starred or asterisked in the figure. And then I also want to think about. Are my drugs getting in if I'm absorb if I'm uh, administering them only enterally? Uh, for example, in this patient, we know that there is severe underlying um, uh, in, uh, uh, intestinal inflammation and ongoing diarrhea. Um, to that point, also making sure that we're getting good exposure, doing TDMs, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring when indicated. Um, that we're providing protection to companion drugs and that we're penetrating the sites of disease of interest, such as the CMS. So back to our patient, what happened? So we had switched to um, a parenteral regimen of rifampin, levo, amikacin with support from um, enterally administered isoniazid and ethambutol for what they were worth. And you can see here um, with challenge of right vamp and IV, there was an immediate increase in the total bilirubin and it was, con it was almost all conjugated. After a few days of rest off of right vamp, um, a single dose was given with a drastic increase again in the um, total bilirubin. So at this point, um, we are seeing clear evidence that the patient is not going to tolerate right vamp. What do you do you know, based on everything that I've said about trying to um, optimize the first line regimen for presumed susceptible disease by keeping a rifamycin in the regimen, what are our other options? And um, the answer, at least in LA County, has been to consider rifabutin. Um, this is based on a couple of observational cohorts, one from you all in Seattle County, um, where you found that 80% of patients who uh, were switched to rifabutin due to right and related adverse events were able to uh, successfully complete therapy, as well as a cohort from Taiwan, which um, broke down um, by the type of adverse event that patients had experienced with right and and essentially um, uh, the, the recurrence of adverse events after switching from rifampin to rifabutin for patients who either had cholestasis or drug-induced hepatitis 
was between five and nine percent, meaning that um, ninety five. In 91 to 95% of those patients actually uh, tolerated ripidine without recurrent adverse, without the same recurrent adverse event. So in general, we think that ripidine um, can be considered an alternative when a patient has recurrent treatment limiting intolerance of lifampin. For going back to our patient again, um, because of the persistent hectic fevers despite attempts to optimize therapy. The patient um, underwent a brain MRI, which showed this large enhancing cystic mass. Um, at that point, dexamethasone was added empirically to the regimen for presumed tuberculoma. And it was actually the addition of the decadron that, or dexamethasone that led to the uh, prompt resolution of fever. So all of the um, tinkering that we were doing with the anti-TB drugs didn't really seem to make much of a difference. Um, and it was really the adjunctive immunomodulation that the patient needed in terms of the clinical status. So in case you're wondering, why did this happen? I think in retrospect, this patient probably did not have Crohn's disease at all. And we were able to go back and prove this by getting the original biopsies that uh, the tissue that um, the diagnosis of Crohn's disease was based on and send it to the CDC IDPB um, that was positive by PCR for TB. Thankfully, this patient was able to complete a total of nine months of um, rifamycin-based anti-TB treatment for what turned out to be pan-susceptible disease. I was pretty sure that this was going to end up being MTB uh, bovis variant, but it wasn't. Um, we optimized INH and rifabutin dosing according to TDMs, and the patient exhibited excellent clinical radiographic and bacteriologic response to therapy eventually. Um, She's been monitored now for four years and has had no evidence of relapse or recurrence. I'll okay. jump into. Yeah. Um, thank sure. you. It's been wonderful. Amazing. Thank you so much. I know you have an additional great case, but I wonder if you can pause. Sure. Uh, and then maybe take a Happy few to. questions and then move on to the next. You know, and Happy also, I, I have to say, I love. Shams rules, you know. So in you know, the hope, you know, we can kind of make some of the slides available to the TV Echo community. So I think that it's 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 a really you know uh, full of wisdom. Thank you. So maybe I'm gonna pause and take just a few questions because we do have a good kiss for more. Any questions so far about this case presentation points? Anything else? Are we good? Are we, you know, there are a lot of content here. I have a question. <laughs> um, Sean, you know, one challenge I have when people have disseminated TB like this and their LFTs become abnormal is trying to differentiate whether their liver is sick because TB is in the liver or it's my medications. How do, how do you think about that? Yeah, so I think um, imaging is helpful here. Um, so if you, you know, you see obvious mass lesions on ultrasound or CT in the liver, that suggests the presence of um, hepatic tuberculosis. And, you know, it, I think it's, it's a really, it's a really challenging call to make. And I've had, I've had colleagues say, what, are you crazy? Continue rifampin? The Billy's seven. And um, I've, you know, it, Sometimes I, I have to say, I have a hunch that this is actually hepatic TB. Let's treat through. And if, if I'm wrong, then we can reassess in a couple of days, but let's try it. And I've had at least one really memorable situation where um, we pushed on rifampin and isoniazid. And it took about a week, but the billy came down from you know teens to uh, single digits. Um, so I would say that it's it definitely uh, 
it definitely gives me pause and makes me nervous when we're doing it. Um, but it's, it, it, it is something that I've seen happen and um, definitely something to keep in mind. Sorry, Th thank you, Sean. So, you know, if it's okay with you, know, let's take one more question from our friends, uh, Janice, and then, you know, I'm gonna ask you to move on to the next case. Janice, go ahead. Um, hi, Sean. I think you and I face similar dilemmas. I actually have a really hard time with the TB meningitis patients with the recommendation of pushing higher on the RIF. Um, and I actually rarely get to the ideal, let's say 20 mg per kg because of the patotoxicity. I, I really think it's definitely dose related. And so often what I end up using is linazolid because I'm trying to get in the CNS. And so I'm trying to use levo, linazolid, think of something else that will get in there. <clears throat> and one of the challenges is if I try to use rifibutin, I think the data on getting into the CNS is based on a, like literally a handful of animals. So I'm not sure <laughs> if mutants penetrating. And when the linazolid starts to drop the platelets, I'm often struggling with, you know, how far do I let them go down? And sometimes I will ask the ICU, typically that's where the patient is, to start transfusions, but that's not sustainable forever. And in my last patient, I actually asked them, and they did it, to start romaplostin, which is a platelet booster. I'm wondering how low you let platelets go before you give up on linazolid, because I've let them go as low as 20,000. And it's really uncomfortable, but yeah. it's such a difficult balance. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I have uh, a, a great answer. Um, in terms of linazolid and thrombocytopenia, I think generally um, once we get below 50,000, I start to uh, think about what my next move is gonna be um, um, for sure. I definitely want to make sure that it's give, being given once a day, 600 milligrams, um, as opposed to the you know, conventional pyogenic infection dosing, which is 600 milligrams PID. Um, I think that in more stable patients, uh, for example, on an ambulatory basis, getting TDMs may be helpful. Um, there are some data suggesting that uh, trough less than two um, may improve the durability of linazolid in uh, multidrug regimens. Um, but I agree with all of your comments otherwise. Thank, thank you, you. Jenny. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Jenny. So, yeah, so um, we're going to ask you, you know, Sean, go back to the case number two. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great questions. Um, and I wish I, I wish I had more definitive answers for you. Um, so this, this is a, another scenario. Um, I think uh, the reason that I don't know if it's because of the unusual nature of the scenarios or when they occurred um, during my uh, short career thus far, um, but this was one of the first phone calls I got um, after graduating from fellowship and starting at TB control program in LA County full time. Um, it was actually probably my first week in the office. Um, it was a 33 year old, woman of Armenian American descent has a history of hepatitis B. Um, hep B core and surface antibodies were both positive. It's HIV negative, has a his history of some sort of ovarian cyst, um, tubal infertility, um, and essentially otherwise unremarkable social history. She presents now um, post IVF with a twin gestation, and she's about, we think, 11 weeks gestational age, presenting with fever, nausea, vomiting, cough, and intermittent hemoptysis for several weeks. She's been taking quite a bit of Tylenol every day for fevers, um, and her exam is remarkable for fever, as well as uh, maybe some CDA tenderness and um, shallow or distant breast sounds. 
She's treated for community acquired pneumonia with ceftriaxone and zithromycin, but continues to have fevers and respiratory symptoms. This is her chest X-ray. Again, as a um, TB, as a clinical TB community, you look at this chest X-ray and think the same thing that we did, which was this looks like miliary tuberculosis. This is a cut from her CT scan. So you can see that there's disease everywhere, fine uh, ground glass opacities and micronodules throughout both lungs. Evaluation for tuberculosis is pursued. Patient is noted to have a positive um, IGRA as well as sputum PCR. Um, smears were negative, cultures were eventually positive. So TB was detected with no resistance. And um, because of baseline elevation in LFTs, patient was started on rifampin, isoniazid, and ephambutol without pyrazinamide. Um, I think this gets to the question about um, uh, could this patient's transaminitis reflect um, TB disease? I think it could definitely um, have reflected that. And I wonder if um, it would have been a good idea to include PZA or uh, despite the, uh, the baseline elevation. Um, they were... Uh, um, slightly high, though, on the higher end, the ALT of 281, T-Billy of 1. Um, on therapy with HRE, the ALT did come down substantially. Um, T-Billy went down to about 0.4. So just a reminder that um, in the setting of pregnancy with presumed pan-susceptible TB, the um, ATS, CDC, IDSA guidelines uh, reflect prior guidance from um, WHO as well, that PZA is likely to be beneficial um, and should uh, generally be included. Although um, uh, uh, patient-centered decision-making is always recommended. So again, what does the ATS CDC IDSA say about patients with underlying potentially underlying liver disease um, in terms of alternative regimens when they when we think that there's too much risk with the first line regimen of HRZD. I think this is the most common one that um, we use as in this case, um, kind of recognizing that the real role of PCA is to shorten total treatment duration below nine months to six months, I think one could argue that this patient with such severe disease um, may warrant a nine-month regimen anyway. And so starting empirically with HRE may be reasonable um, to reduce the, the um, synergistic uh, risk of hepatotoxicity from first-line drugs. They also mention an INH and PZA3 regimen In our practice here in LA, I think if you are able to uh, keep a patient on um, well-dosed rifamycin, ethambutol, and fluoroquinolone, um, this is probably more like a nine to 12 month regimen rather than a 12 to 18 month. Um, but we do require the inclusion of um, a third likely effective agent with a preference for fluoroquinolones. And then, of course, you know, extrapolating from data on INH monoresistant TB um, using REZ plus minus a fluoroquinolone for six months may be acceptable. Um, um, I think this trades out the hepatotoxicity of INH for PZA, which on a per day uh, or per week um, uh, basis, PZA is probably more likely to be hepatotoxic than INH, but um, also a consideration. And then there's the, the fully second line regimens. Um, and this is largely extrapolated from uh, patients with drug resistant tuberculosis. One big um, gap I think in 
the guidance here, which is carried forward from the 2006 hepatotoxicity guidelines um, and the previous 2003 CDS, ATS, IDSA guidelines is um, the absence of consideration of other potential second line agents that can be liver sparing or non-hepatotoxic. Um, in my experience, once daily linazolid um, at 600 milligrams for adults is not likely to be hepatotoxic. Um, uh, of course, linazolid can cause mitochondrial toxicity. Um, and so at the conventional dosing for pyogenic infections, 600 milligrams twice a day, um, I wouldn't dispute that it could cause hepatotoxicity, but on the once daily doses, um, I just haven't seen it um, convincingly. There are other agents to consider here as well, like clofazamine um, and others. Again, this is the uh, from the, the review paper from 2014 by authors in India who suggest um, uh, designing the empiric regimen for patients with presumed pan-susceptible TB according to child Q um, class. Um, this is, again, an expert recommendation based on their experience, not necessarily very evidence-based. So what happened with our patient? So after um, nearly a week and a half of uh, HRE, her ALT started to go up. Um, she already had a lot of nausea and vomiting just due to her pregnancy, but um, things started to um, get worse in association with this uh, rise in the ALT. And so as a result, TB meds were held. You can see that we've gotten to five times upper limit of normal, that threshold of 250. And LFTs were found to be stable. So TB meds were continued to be held. Um, I think at this point in retrospect, probably what we should have done is considered starting an alternate regimen with second line drugs. Um, obviously, there needs to be a lot of patient-centered decision-making here um, for a woman who's um, uh, just getting out of the first trimester of pregnancy as well. You have to think about um, fetal toxicities and, and risk assessment. Um, while on this pause in anti-TB treatment, seen in urgent care for worsening cough, um, as well as some concern for um, uh, preterm labor, possibly, but um, was found to have reassuring fetal heart tones and no rupture of membranes. At that point, um, the decision was made in consultation with the treating ID physicians and us at TB Control um, to offer a liver sparing regimen um, which in our practice consists of levofloxacin and ethambutol as a core, plus at least one other likely effective potent agent. In this case, we chose linazolid. And this is kind of our approach um, to building these so-called liver sparing bridges um, uh, to help avoid undue, un undue interruptions in um, all anti-TB treatment, particularly when patients have pretty severe disease. So starting with um, a core of ethambutol and levofloxacin, and then trying to layer in um, drugs to get to our targets. So in summary, this is what the patient received. Um, we did feel that the linazolid ethambutol levofloxacin was maybe a little bit weak, but um, we needed to consider rechallenging. I think, again, in retrospect, I would have rechallenged sooner rather than waiting until delivery. Um, um, Rifampin was challenged at one point, and the LFTs went up. Patient went to urgent care, and we went back to levo with ambutol and azolid. Late in uh, pregnancy now, um, mom presents with 
it's on Linnae's lid of Hambitol uh, and levofloxacin with rupture of membranes, uterine cramping, um, having converted her cultures for at least four months, has had improved radiographic findings um, and has had this treatment history. So how do we determine how far into um, therapy we are with all of these changes in regimen? In LA County, this is um, uh, this summarizes an approach that we have used. Um, I refer to it as the um, Wong formula or Wong equation. Um, uh, my colleague Stephen Wong described this in a poster at MTCA in 2015. Um, but basically using a denominator for each stage of the regimens that the patient has received. And um, you eventually want the numerator over denominator when you add them all up to get to one. So applying that to our patient um, received about five weeks of rifamycin based therapy and 13 and a half weeks of rifamycin free or rifamycin less therapy. So really at this point, um, several months into the diagnosis, we've only gotten about a third through um, what we what we had wanted to get to. This is the repeat chest x-ray, which I think looks better for what it's worth, and repeat chest CT. Also improved still some ground glass uh, uh, opacities and nodularities. At this point, the infants are born via vaginal delivery. They're a little bit premature. They uh, sustain some of the uh, pretty common complications of premature delivery, uh, infant respiratory distress syndrome. They um, briefly need some uh, mechanical ventilation and receive surfactant. Somebody decides to send um, the placenta for pathology and um, actually do uh, AFB staining on it. And it looks, you can see a couple of the cilli there on the placental swab. At this point, um, as a consultant, as a newly graduated ID consultant for TB control, um, and the only one at the time with the uh, um, pediatric board certification, I reminded everybody that in Remington and Klein, the neonatal infectious disease textbook, it says that you can have involvement of the placenta without it affecting the fetus. But somebody also decided to check the amniotic fluid that these babies were swimming in. And that was also AFB stain positive. And not just a little bit, but a lot. So in my opinion, I think these babies were definitely, you know, congenitally exposed, congenitally infected. Uh, thankfully, their postnatal bacteriologic evaluations were all negative. Um, but when this happened, we got really concerned that maybe our liver sparing regimen wasn't adequate. Maybe that was maybe the patient, the index had progressed or developed pelvic disease um, and or or had vaselinia that somehow seeded the um, the uh, pelvic organs and caused this infection later. So we sent the um, amniotic fluid sediment for molecular testing, looking for not just presence of TB, but also for acquired resistance. And there wasn't any, at least not for fluoroquinolones or any of the other drugs that the patient had been exposed to. Um, this, this amniotic fluid was eventually culture negative, as was the placenta. We went back and made sure that the um, original isolate was susceptible to linazolid as well, which it was. This was done at um, National Jewish. So I think in retrospect, you remember that mom had ampular, uh, ampullary or tubal infertility. And I think this so-called dermoid cyst was probably actually tubal 
tuberculosis or over ovo to uh, uh, ovo to ovarian tubal um, tuberculosis that somehow um, uh, that and somehow she still was able to conceive um, and that these um, infants actually developed or fetuses actually developed in a tuberculous pelvis. Um, this has been described now um, a number of times in the literature is post IVF uh, congenital TB due to unrecognized GU TB in the, in the mother. Um, thankfully, the story ended up um, uh, positively, just like the last one. Mom completed therapy, the infants completed therapy as well, and they've been disease free after two years. Uh, post treatment monitoring. One last point that I want to make is that as we gain more and more experience in the United States with uh, bedaquiline predominant linazolid plus minus moxie based regimens um, for resistant disease, there is a growing trend or emerging practice of using these regimens for patients with rifamycin intolerance. Um, in LA, we've started doing this as well, and um, we do drug levels, we monitor very closely, and um, we select patients very carefully depending on the level of liver disease that they have um, at baseline, um, reversible or otherwise, but um, this has been our experience so far. So there may be a role for these new drugs as well, um, although dosing in uh, established liver disease is unclear <clears throat> at this time. So a couple of things to summarize. Um, it's really important for us to evaluate at baseline and then monitor. Um, there have been some proposed standardized approaches. Uh, some are, um, or a few of them are very evidence-based, but if we're consistent uh, in the way that we implement our approach, um, that can at least improve predictability and outcomes. Um, and then there should be some consideration for newer agents, uh, not just rifambutin, but also bedaquiline and pertominid to uh, provide treatment shortening to patients who are unable to tolerate first line drugs. References, acknowledgements. Thank you to everybody for listening and sticking around. Um, I'll take any questions.